Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoneham Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoneham, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonehammemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. Hello. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Wow, it's good to be here, right? What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. Uh, I don't know how your week was, but... Uh, it was an interesting week for some of us. Uh, one thing that never happened to me before, I took Freddie to a doctor's appointment and, uh, um, and I left the car on the whole time that he was in the appointment, like two and a half hours. I don't know if that last birthday that I had is changing things, but we're praying that it was just an accident. And, Things like that will not continue to happen. But it, it's, been, uh, it's been a good week, right? Busy, a lot of things going on. But uh, uh, for some people, it's been really good, better than others. You know, for who, who's been a, a really good week is for Cynthia. Today is her birthday. Wow, you want to say happy birthday? <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's just turning 29, she told me. <laughs> so we celebrate with her today, and we pray that uh, this will be a year of blessing, and uh, God will be with you during this year. Also, um, GVA is looking for substitute teachers, so if God is calling you to do that, uh, contact GVA. I guess things are going well at the school, and they needing more help. Also, um, the evangelism training for the conference, um, IHARO, is free and is going to be on November 1st. How many days from now? Uh, like eight days? Eight days, right? So um, you can um, ask us for more information if you want to be in that training. They're going to be several speakers. It's obviously, it's going to be on Zoom, but I'm sure that we can also learn like that, right? We have been learning like that. Yeah, so, uh, so if you need more information about it, um, let us know. Also, uh, remember that we were giving those uh, thumb drives. If some of you have those, just um, you know, just go through the, um, to the studies and let us know what you think and pray about it if God is leading you to start a small group or to start a Bible study. That can be a blessing for you and a blessing for others. Again, we're happy that today is the Sabbath and that we get to worship God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you because we know that you have given us this day, that we can rest, that we can experience your presence in a special way. So, Lord, we ask that um, you can be with us this day. We ask, Lord, so for Cynthia, she's uh, having a birthday today, that you can be with her, Lord, that you can bless her, and that you give her a good year with good health, and that the most important thing that she will um, continue to be closer and closer with you. Be with us, Lord, this Sabbath, because we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, children. <laughs> We're all children, aren't we? And... Uh, how many of you have enjoyed the beautiful flowers, the coloration of the flowers? Just coming up and down 93, it just, oh, 
you're awestruck. It's so beautiful. I think this is one of the most beautiful ones that we've had in a long time. I'm going to start with uh, some Bible text before I start the story, which involves the story, actually. And you all know this one. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going to skip down to 11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in it, and according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. So what day, what day did God create the tree? I gave it to you. <laughs> the third day. Because in order to have grass and herbs, you need land, right? And uh, the waters were separated from uh, each other and land was there. So the third day, excellent. Now I averted to my our drive down today and also going back and forth from Stoneham to, uh, to Methuen where we live, just looking at the trees. Are they that way all year long? No, no. In fact, in the winter, they're quite bare. Are they still alive? Yes, they are, because um, the tree still needs sunlight or solo, solar energy. It still needs water. And amazingly, it needs sugar. It needs sugar. Not the kind that you and I are used to, but a different kind of sugar. So the process is still going on, but it might be in the roots. You don't see it, and it's also in the, you don't see it either because it's behind the bark. But that would be the winter. It's sort of like a, a different type of uh, normal, like we're going through. And uh, so inside, what you see here is a, a tree that looks like it's dead, but it's not. It's still living and getting nourishment. In the summer, what a difference. What a difference. We have the lush green. And um, this is where it's very important for the leaves. The leaves actually give life. One of the uh, reasons that the tree lives is because of the leaves. Leaves make sugar and feed it to the rest of the tree. Of course, it takes in the air. The, you know, when we breathe out, what is that called? What kind of air? Carbon dioxide. And the trees take that, absorb it. And they also take in the solar energy, which is the sun, and they love the rain. So you have those elements that help um, keep the tree alive as well. This way, this way. So winter, summer, fall. <laughs> I love this. It's just so pretty. They're not real, but they're just so colorful. The yellows, the golds, the little bit of green on there. Are they still, is the tree still alive? Indeed it is. Indeed it is. And um, the leaves, again, still are making sugar. But something's happening to these leaves. What's happening to the leaves? Are they vibrant green anymore? No. They're drying out, as it were. They're losing that green color, but they're giving us a, a beautiful arrangement of fall colors, as we call it. We call it fall because the leaves do fall. Why do they fall? They're not making sugar anymore. They're st it's slowing down. The process is slowing down. And then this is the effect after, after all the leaves have uh, fallen. Not all trees lose their leaves. We have some, like your pine tree family, they stay. They're green all the time. But the ones that have um, the broad leaf, they lose their leaves. So enjoy the fall, but remember the winter. The tree's not dead. 
It's growing. It's, uh, the leaves are really giving a lot of good food to the tree, and they give us color. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful seasonal lesson about what you have created for us. Amen? Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's great to be here today in the Lord's Day. And if you're watching from home, I'm sure you're having a blessed Sabbath day also. I'm here to remind us that we still have a, a local budget. Uh, whether you give online, whether you give here and drop it off in uh, the boxes or whether you mail it. Uh, in the mail by way of a check. Our local budget uh, includes many things, the lights that you see, the heat that you don't feel, uh, the cleaning, constant cleaning of our church. And, and our budget right now is a little low, although tithes are high and, and they're progressing, but our local budget is low. The golden rule that is in Luke 631 introduces us to the gold standard of behavior toward others. It states that whatever you would like from people, you should do the same for them first. This is the very sound advice. Yet Matthew asks the very poignant question, if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Matthew 5, 46. In other words, if we only offer transactional love and desire something in return, that love is meaningless. In many instances in the Gospels, Jesus teaches his follow followers to love, give, and help unconditionally. As a Seventh-day Adventist nonprofit institution, we are called to look for opportunities of service to our local communities. A parishioner once related a story to his pastor about a church. This Adventist church became so vital to the lifeblood of the local community that if it were to be relocated without a warning, the local community would greatly suffer. Have we become such indispensable extensions of our local communities? Are we serving them unconditionally without any ulterior motives? The golden rule states that we are to love as we are loved. Jesus goes one step further when he asks us to love unconditionally. Think about it. If our church would not exist anymore or if we were to move, would our community in Estonia miss us? I think so. If you know our church very well, you know that we have a community service center not too far from here on Gary Street. And they serve over 100 people every week with food food that they need to survive with, food that they look forward to coming and getting. And that community service center has been there uh, uh, a few years now, quite a few years, and people rely on it. People in Stoneham, people in our church, people from other towns uh, uh, locally that need food. So, yes, we, we would be missed as far as that... Um, community service center is concerned. But think about things that you can do in our community. If, you're, if you weren't here anymore, would your neighbors miss you? Would our neighbors here around here miss us? And those things that you could do for people with unconditional love is what God is talking about to love others as you would love yourself. So think about that. And don't forget our offering, a local church budget, 
Uh, it's a little low right now, and we need to boost that back up again. May God bless you this Sabbath day. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading today is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 28. Romans 8, chapter 28. And I am going to be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Good morning. For those who can, please kneel with me. And let's pray. Dear Father, awesome and holy is your name. Thank you for your mercy and love. We humble ourselves before you in prayer and worship your great name. We thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath when we can pause from our hectic lives and spend time with you and remember you, God, our creator and redeemer. You are in control, and we thank you with appreciation and rejoicing for that truth as we witness the chaos in the world. And we can be content and at peace that you are in control of everything. You have already overcome the world, and your kingdom will last forever. We pray for our local church leaders, Pastor Freddie and Pastor Christy, and their families. We pray for them especially as we remember them during Pastor Appreciation Month. Lord, thank you for them and for gr the great work that they do for you. We pray for our Seventh-day Adventist national and world leaders. And we pray for our nation's president. Please provide them all with the wisdom and grace to lead your people. Thank you for the freedom to worship you, God, and for our church family. May they receive a blessing the Sabbath day and know that they are loved and cared about, even while we are apart from one another. We thank you for the personal ways you connect with us each day, proving time and time again we are not alone in any day, whatever we are experiencing. And finally, we thank you for the loving act you did for us on the cross. We don't deserve it, but we thank you for your righteousness that covers us. We certainly need it, Lord. May your name ever be glorified. Amen.
Wow, that was beautiful. Yeah. I don't know how she does it, but Ashley does always a good job with music. So we're blessed uh, by that music. I'm sure that all of you here have made plans and that all your plans went exactly the way that you thought they were going to go, right? It's not like that? But I think uh, when we are in heaven, when we are in the presence of Jesus, and we see how he has led in our lives, I think that we will be happy to know that some of our prayers were not answered <laughs> the way that we uttered them, but that God uh, gave us something better. Even though sometimes it doesn't look like that at the present time. The will of the Lord will be done, said the apostles and, and the, the people who were traveling with Paul after they tried to convince him that going to Jerusalem was not a good idea. It was not a good idea because he knew what was going to happen there and not just him, but other people, prophets, told him what was awaiting him in Jerusalem. So what do you do? If you know that if you go to a place, some things are going to happen to you, uh, I tell you what I will do. Because a lot of our decisions are based on avoiding suffering. If you think about it, most of the things that, that we do are based on that, that how, how we base our choices. Avoiding pain, avoiding suffering, avoiding conflict, avoiding controversy. That's how we made our choices most of the times. But a lot of times, that's not the way that we should go. In fact, we, we learn in our story this morning that that Paul knows the things that are awaiting him in Jerusalem, but he still goes. Because he, he has come to understand something. That his plans are in the hands of God. And that's the best place to be. That's the, that's the best place to be. And if we do that, we will have no regrets. Even though we find ourselves sometimes in difficult moments in our lives. Because the reality is that a lot of times, often, we don't see the things the way God sees them. A lot of times we see problems, but God sees blessing. A lot of times we see hindrances, but God sees opportunities. So we read in, uh, in Romans chapter 8, because this is Paul talking here, and it sounds good, and I, I'm sure that we are familiar with this text. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 and verse 28. He says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Who is the one that does the helping? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then he says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So he wants us to understand that when we are in the hands of God, the Holy Spirit is our interpreter in our prayers. He is the one that translates our prayers to God. Are you thankful for that? So many times we pray for something and we think that, oh, this is going to be a blessing for me, but then we receive something else. And then we say, 
thank you, God, because you didn't give me what I prayed for, but you gave me something better. That was not just the life of Paul, because Paul learned this from Jesus. He had studied the life of Christ. He had heard about the life of Jesus. And I like how Ellen White explains this in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. That's the name of the book in page 71. She says, The Father's presence encircled Christ. And nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. What she's saying is everything that happened in the life of Christ is because the Father allowed him to happen. Wow. Here was his source of comfort. Really? All the things that happened to Jesus were, were his source of comfort? And it is for us too, she says. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior, who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil. That's talking about us. For Christ is his defense. Nothing, nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. Wow. And all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. Have you stopped and thought about this for a moment? That everything that happened in the life of Christ? You read the final scenes in his life? Uh, the way people treated him? That was his source of comfort because he knew that there was a bigger purpose for his life. I'm sure that all of us here have gone through difficult moments. Some moments that, even though it was probably many years ago, those memories are still fresh. And sometimes they bring pain to our lives because those things were really difficult. But even in those difficult circumstances, when we look back, we will see, number one, that God was there, that we were not alone. And number two, we will see that, that God was working something beautiful that if we haven't seen yet, we will see it when Jesus comes. And then we will say, thank God. Thank God because uh, I didn't receive the answer to my prayer. <laughs> but God gave me something better. I think about, uh, since we are in October, and if you knew something about me, I love history. I love history. I love Christian history. But what I love the most is Adventist history. I love Adventist history since I was little. I have read so many books about Adventist history. And, uh, and it gives us hope. Last week, I was with a Spanish church in Washington, New Hampshire, in the Adventist church there, that one of the first Adventist churches. And, uh, and, and we were talking about uh, how God chose uh, those humble uh, people without much education, but he used them to do something wonderful. And we are here because their efforts. And it is important for us to look back, um, not just for the sake of looking back where we have been, but looking back so we can see where God, where God was with this movement and where God is leading us as a church. That is important to know where we're going. So last week I was talking about, and probably I will talk about it next week, about 1844, the great disappointment, or how I call it, the great appointment where God called his people 
to a special message for the last days. So as we were talking, um, Ellen White had a vision, and, and in this vision, she saw some of the people who died uh, before 1844. And, you know, we know some of these stories of people who died before 1844, and they died with the hope that they were going to see Jesus in a few days. But as we know, Jesus didn't come in a few days after 1844. More than 160 years, we are, all, we are still here. And we, we hope that we will see Jesus soon. But Ellen White has, has a vision. I can give you the quotation later, or you can look for it. But she sees some of those early Adventist pioneers who died before 1844. And she sees them in heaven. And when she sees them in heaven, they ask her what happened. And, and she says that, that when she tried to remember all the sufferings and trials and tribulations that they have been through, she couldn't remember. Because you see, in light of what Jesus has for us, all the trials and tribulations will seem so small. They will seem nothing. In fact, she said that she couldn't remember. And you know, and sometimes we think about all, all the things that happen to us, and we think that that's the end. But I want to tell you this morning that that is not the end. That God is working something beautiful in your life. And, uh, and the Apostle Paul says that the, the, the sufferings of this present time are not compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So that means that God has something better, that if we compare the things that we're going through to what God has for us, is not even worthy to remember. So we need to we need to see God's purpose in all of our lives. If we are in the hands of God, those things will bring something beautiful. But as Paul says, we work together for good to them that love God. So that's wonderful that Paul says that. And I'm sure that a lot of times we say these words and we're not, probably not at the best time. When someone is sick at the hospital, we say, you know, don't worry about it. That's nothing. God will work something good out of it. I don't think that's the right attitude. Though it's true that God will bring something good and maybe, you know, he will work something and at the end, it will not be, the suffering will not be compared to what God has in store for that person. But, um, but I think when we have been through suffering, that's why when the Bible talks about Jesus, he said that he was experienced in our sufferings. He knew that what he talked. So it's wonderful that Paul says this thing here in Romans, but what is it that he does? You know, one thing is to say something and one thing is to live by it, to, to, um, to do those things and find that joy in doing the will of God, even though things don't go the way that you planned them. He says, Acts 21, verse 10 and 14. We go back to our story. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And at the same way, when Jesus was going to Jerusalem in, in Luke, uh, when Jesus set his way to Jerusalem, he's going to die at Jerusalem. So Paul also is going to Jerusalem. He's not going to die in Jerusalem, but a lot of sufferings await him when he goes into Jerusalem. And he says, I will stay many days. A certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owned his belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered 
What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. So when he would not be persuaded, we, we see it saying, the will of the Lord will be done. People have the best intentions for Paul, but they don't understand his calling. So I want to make a point here. Don't expect other people to understand the calling that God has placed in your life. Your call is unique. And, and other people will not understand. Probably some people will discourage you because for them it doesn't make sense. But it makes sense for you. It makes sense for you because you're the one who has received that call. So they give up because they know that, uh, that he is determined. He knows that God has called him. He knows that God has a plan for him. And he will do what other people seem as making not sense. He will do it because he knows the one who has called him. So I don't know if this morning... I'm talking to someone who feels that God has called him or called her to do something. And, uh, uh, and maybe you have shared that with other people and, and they think that that's not the best idea. That it doesn't make sense financially or it doesn't make sense at all. But I want to tell you that, that if you pray and if you know that, that God is calling you to do that, that you need to go ahead and move. And move doing God's will. Because the best place to be is in the hands of God. You don't want to be anywhere else. Even though it doesn't make sense for others. And I'm sure that some of us have made those decisions in our life. Where we have moved to places where we don't know anyone. Where we have uh, made those decisions that didn't make sense. But we know that that's God's will for our lives. And uh, some time ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I don't know if you read in the news about this missionary who went into this tribe. And, uh, and he was killed by that tribe because he was preaching to them. And a lot of people criticize him because we live in a world that all those sacrifices don't make sense. This man went, he, he had studied the culture, he had learned the language, and he had a burden for these people to reach them with the gospel, and he went. And the media and everyone else started to criticize him. You know, this man is so, uh, that's presumption. Why do, why, why do you go and, and preach? I mean, like, we don't need to go other places. Like, everyone knows God, there's no need to do that. And then I started thinking about those missionaries who made sacrifices. They were not understood, but they went to so many places, to so many countries. And it is because of that that some of us came to know about Jesus. I'm sure that it didn't make sense for everyone else, but it makes sense for that person that God has called. So it's very easy to, to see it and judge others who are doing something instead of praying for them. So even good people, even friends with good intentions, sometimes don't know, don't know what is best for you. So we know, right? Paul goes then and meets with, uh, with James. And James and the leaders give him bad advice. And something that I learned about Paul is that for him, unity is important. And, and this, this is something that we need to think about. Because we live in a time where church splits because people see things different. We are split because of tradition. We are split because someone doesn't like the music. Then I'm going to go and start my own church. That's, that's what I have seen those things. But, but not Paul. Paul knows that circumcision is nothing. He has said that in, 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 in his writings. But then um, James, 
James, who, who is the leader of the church of Jerusalem, and you have to understand this, because when, when you read about the persecution that started after Stephen was stoned, the, the Jerusalem church was not persecuted. The Jerusalem church stayed in Jerusalem. It was the Hellenistic, the, the Greek-speaking Jews and those from outside who were persecuted. Uh, we read in Acts that everyone else stay in Jerusalem. The leaders stay in Jerusalem. So it's been like 25 years now. And they are used to being in Jerusalem. So they, they know that they can be there, be Christians. But they know how, to, how not cause trouble. And the way to not cause trouble for them is not to say... Uh, not to argue, not to contradict the things that they know they're going to cause them problems. So they are there, and we read in Acts 21, verse 23 and 24. This is James giving bad advice to Paul. Therefore, he says, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. He's talking about ceremonial laws here and they want him to keep those laws or to give the, the appearance that for him that's important. And he doesn't want to cause any, any conflict so he says, okay, I will go. Ellen White says that God was not involved in the counsel that James gave. He was looking what was best for him, avoiding persecution. So I'm going to, he didn't know all the things that he was doing that were not right. That's why I, um, it is important for us, number one, to understand that God has a calling for each one of us. And number two, that sometimes unity is more important than being right. I'm not talking about theological issues that are the pillars of our faith. But I'm talking about preferences. Those things are not worth that we split as churches for small things like that. So Paul goes there, and because Paul knows, he has learned that sometimes uh, to, to work for the Jews, he has to be a Jew. To work for the Gentiles, he needs to work in a different way, not that he accommodates his theology, but that he... Um, he contextualized his message to reach different groups. So he goes and says, okay, if this is going to help to the cause of Christ, I'm going to go there. Because of that, Alan White says that the church, I'm paraphrasing here, lost someone too soon. Because of the advice that James and the elders gave, the church lost a leader too soon. He, he could have been of more, more benefit to the church, but because the church looking just for themselves, they, uh, they failed to give good, good advice. You know what the problem of James was? He was put in tradition first. You know what was his other problem? He was putting his country first. For him, being a Jewish was more important than everything else. So I want to move to 2020. And, and what I see is that a lot of times we, I have to add myself now because I am an American, we tend to put our country first. And I think that sends the wrong message. And forgive me for saying this. But I think that God needs to be first. And when we understand that God is first, we're going to stop fighting for political parties. Because we are going to understand that our calling is higher than a political party. We're going to understand that, that being faithful to Jesus... And doing his will is, is the most important thing. We're going to understand 
that even though I am a proud American and I love that passport that I can go to a lot of places, I understand that our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven. So we have a higher calling and we belong to a, a, to a country, to a city, Paul says in Hebrews, whose builder and architect is God. That's our calling. And when we get distracted, we start defending political parties, and we start defending candidates, and we think that that's of gospel, <laughs> we're, we're going to be shocked because that is not what we have been called to do. We need to respect our laws, and we need to be good citizens, but we need to understand that our country is heaven. So, as I started, sometimes our decisions are based on avoiding conflict and avoiding pain. So I hope that I, I did that today and I didn't create conflict here. But, uh, but we need to always, always remember the one who has called us. Paul's decision is about doing the will of God. And if the will of God goes against the traditions of my country, there is a time when God's people respond to a higher law. It is necessary to obey God rather than men. Do you agree? So we need to obey God. We need to respect our laws as long as they don't contradict God's law. But we respond to a higher law, the law of love. Our, our love for our country sometimes will come between us and God. And I will tell you why. Because we, we sometimes will be looking for solutions in this world to problems that are not solved in this world. The only one who can solve all that is wrong in this world is not, is not who's going to be elected on November 3rd. If your hope is in that, you're going to be really disappointed. Our hope is in the one who says, Behold, I make everything new. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that we will always, that we will always choose God. That we will learn to hear his voice, to do his will. And to do the right thing, Ellen White says, do the heavens fall. Do you want to tell Jesus this morning that with his help, you want to follow him all the way that, where he lives? Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you because we have been redeemed by him. And Father, even though we are in this world, we are not of this world, but we belong to him. So Father, we ask that you can help us, Lord, to understand the purpose for our lives. Help us, Lord, to do your will. And help us, Lord, to finish the work that you have given us. Lord, help us not to get distracted in the things that happen around us, that we will look a little higher where Jesus is, and that as we see him, we will keep our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith. Be with our church, Father, and help us to stay focused on what you have called us to do. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Hello, this is Pastor Christy Hodson. Thank you for watching our program today. We hope to see you soon in person or live on YouTube for our Saturday morning worship service. You can also find information about online Bible study groups at our website, stonemmemorialchurch.org. We currently have a food bank and clothing distribution center located at 9 Gary Street and operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool at 108 Pond Street. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.